And in the last unit, we talked about the idea of culture that people have, uh, that, that human behavior is patterned and that people learn those patterns. And that, uh, and the idea or the technique of ethnographic field work, which is basically you go out and you live with people and you uh, do participant observation, you observe and participate as much as possible in order to learn those patterns and learn how people learn those patterns. And neither of these things are, uh, are very complex ideas. In some ways, they're pretty basic, but they really went against the prevalent idea of the times that people were organized as sort of superior to inferior, and that those the organization of people was based on your your sort of biological destiny or your environmental destiny, and that would uh, limit your capacities in the world or determine the way in which you are going to uh, be uh, incorporated into the world. And so again, anthropologists were not uh, were not especially especially good people, but they did start to rethink how these uh, these previous ideas were held and began to challenge uh, some of these ideas that in some ways we were destined or determined by our biology. And so they uh, look, went and looked at things like in the last unit, we talked about language and the arbitrariness and openness of human language and how everyone has language. Uh, in the last class, we looked at uh, religion and rituals, things that people uh, in in some European societies at the time assumed that people did not have in other societies. That only there were certain only true uh, there were certain true religions or sophisticated religious beliefs, and there were others who did not have those things. Today we're going to be looking at the idea of of economics, food procurement and subsistence, how people move things around, distribute things, uh, make a living in their society. And again, this is something that uh, for many people outside or for many people in the European North American experience, it was assumed that in other societies, they just didn't do it right, that they were sort of inefficient or stupid about the way that they organized their economy. And so uh, anthropologists, uh, were instrumental in doing fieldwork that revealed that people not only had patterns, but that they made sense, and that they could make sense uh, in, in different environments. And so I would say that what I perhaps didn't stress strongly enough uh, during that the time that I first showed this slide is that, that these very simple ideas and simple techniques resulted in a, in a rethinking, a radical rethinking, a radical reshaping of how people looked at the world and how people saw human life and our, our place on the planet. Uh, so today we're talking about economics and subsistence. For Thursday, we will talk about politics and how people organize themselves and govern themselves. And then in the next week after that, we're going to be talking about gender, sexuality, kinship, marriage, family, organizations. Um, and then uh, what's not on this slide, our final final couple classes are going to be about power and inequality, which we should always be thinking about when we think about these things. And also uh, how do we apply these lessons or how can we, how can we take what this radical rethinking of the world and use it to maybe do something different in the world we're in. So that's where we uh, where we are, where we've been, and where we are going. These chapters at the end of Lavin and Schultz, I think, can get pretty heavy. And because there's so much material, there's so much possible material that they can be drawing upon, um, sometimes they get a little bit uh, too complicated, I believe. And so we're going to be trying to get sort of the main points and and get some some of the complexities without worrying too much uh, that we not that that we're not uh, understanding every single idea that comes up because there's just a, an enormous wealth of material there. So I actually wanted to start with uh, a a story uh, 
uh, from uh, the anthropologist Richard Lee about his time in the Kalahari, about doing field work there and what happened to him. Um, it's, I hope it's kind of from the same era of, of time and, and actually the same publication, Natural History, as uh, Shakespeare in the Bush. So this was from that, what we might call that classic 1950s, 1960s period of anthropology, when people were doing some, some kinds of field work with, in societies and doing things that, that people really hadn't done before in terms of looking professionally at another society. Um, so this is building on, uh, you think about the film that we watched, Strange Beliefs with Evans Pritchard, who was a little bit earlier than, 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 these, than these anthropologists, uh, the 1930s and 1940s, but still in that same tradition of really doing professional academic studies among peoples who really hadn't been thought of as, uh, as carriers of philosophy or religious beliefs or an economic system. And so there's Richard Lee and he's in the Kalahari. And one of the things that anthropologists always like to do to establish rapport or friendship with the people that they're with is usually it's nice to share food with people. But Richard Lee was in a curious position in that he could not share food because that was the object of his study. And so here he was, he had his food, but he was, he was a professional at also calculating the way, you know, how much, a, how much an animal, how much meat was on an animal, how much, how much vegetable, that was his, his thing was trying to calculate exactly how the, the people in this area were able to get food and their kind of protein levels and things like that. And a lot of the, uh, if you remember back to the Jared Diamond article that we read, The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race, a lot of the ideas or a lot of the data that Diamond drew upon was actually first found by Richard Lee. He's the one who calculated the number of hours it took to procure uh, food among a, a hunting and gathering society. Uh, and some of the quotes, even some of the quotes that Jared Diamond uses were directly from Richard Lee's field work. He doesn't, uh, Diamond didn't, does not cite Richard Lee, which has always bothered me, he kind of in some ways plagiarized from Richard Lee. And that's why I always ask you when you're doing your comments to be, make sure if someone else has talked about your theme, that you show them some love. You don't want to be just copying and borrowing somebody else's work without uh, helping out on that. So Richard Lee is out there and he's, he can't share his food. He can share tobacco, which they also like. So, you know, that's also a classic anthropological thing that, that we used to do back when people did more tobacco things. Um, so, you know, you'd at least be able to sit around and smoke with people. And we can ask if that may have interrupted their, their food habits, but uh, in general, we probably think that it was a, at most a minor interruption. And so Lee was studying, he, he was trying to figure out what was going on with their economic system. And he was thinking of it as an economic system. And this was pretty novel because uh, they were uh, the, the people he was studying Oh, and by the way, I should say that there's a bunch of click noises in this language. Uh, and so there's some, there's various uh, uh, um, um, different uh, punctuation marks which indicate clicks. Uh, but the people he was studying were hunters and gatherers. And for much of, uh, as we talked about, for much of, of the European population, people thought that hunters and gatherers were kind of not they didn't have a system at all, that they were savages, that they were primitives, or that they were running after inefficient, and they should be replaced by agriculture. And so what uh, Lee was saying is that he was studying a hunter-gathering society, which also in general uh, procured their food by gathering and hunting, but also when they uh, exchanged their food, you might say shared their food, it was something based on what anthropologists call reciprocity, which is a word uh, 
that uh, we may know already. It's it's not a it's not a it's not a word exclusively owned by anthropologists. But reciprocity means that people are giving to each other in such a way that that you're you're giving it and you're in some ways getting something in return. And uh, in the in the people that that Lee is studying. Uh, they were doing something called what we call generalized reciprocity, which is that there's not a there's not an accounting system. People are sharing with each other, and there's not a strict tallying of what people are are giving to each other. There are other systems in which we call them balanced reciprocity, in which you give something to somebody, and then you are actually expecting a gift in return later on that it may even be larger than the one that you gave. And so there's this kind of delay plus uh, interest. We'll talk about that uh, in, the, in the next class more. But basically it's a way in which people exchange that is not based on money or the market, but is a, a form of, of gift giving, you might say. And so, if you remember, Lee is in this situation where he is, uh, people are getting pissed off at him over time because he doesn't share food. And he's trying to explain to them why he can't share food. But he says, well, you know, the Christmas holiday is coming up, which is a big feast time there. And so he thinks, I'm going to be able to uh, buy them this, you know, I'll, I'll buy them the biggest ox I can find. So he goes out and finds the biggest ox. And uh, he's, like you said, he's an expert at, at calculating how much meat is on an animal. So he's pretty good at, at, at figuring that out. And so he goes out to buy the biggest ox. What happens? What do they say about this ox? <laughs> they start making fun of it. Right? They start teasing him. They start getting mad. They're saying, hey, man, it doesn't have any meat. It doesn't have any fat. We're going to all be sad at Christmas time. You ruin Christmas. You know, they start making fun of him and all this stuff. And, um, you know, he's actually thinking, well, maybe I should, maybe I should get out of town. Maybe I should leave because, you know, they've been telling me they're going to they're going to get into a fight instead of being happy. They wanted to dance, but now they say I've ruined Christmas. And uh, eventually, well, he, you know, he, it turns out there's a bunch of meat on this ox. It's wonderful and great and full of fat. And they dance for days, laugh, fall down laughing. And he's confused. Why did they do that? Make a zoomer come in. Why do they do that? No unmuters. Some of you said in the comments, right? They tell them, well, this is how we keep people from getting big heads, from getting arrogant, from getting puffed up, because we all need to share with each other and say, you don't want somebody. If you remember back to our discussion of hunter and gatherer societies, they tend to be relatively egalitarian. You don't want to have somebody uh, get getting puffed up. And so this is something that they not only did to Richard Lee, but they did that to uh, each other in order to make sure that everybody's on the same playing field and, and, and being uh, basically equal around the, uh, around the group. And so Lee kind of ends with this idea, which is an interesting idea that, you know, he says, you know, I thought I was going to buy them this ox and that would sort of repay my year of living with them and not sharing anything. And, you know, as it turns out, that's what they do for each other on a daily basis without wanting to be, get thanked for it all the time. And so, uh, you know, he ends up thinking about this as, you know, what their, their message as you know, whenever we do something that is supposedly generous or, or big hearted, there might be 
uh, so that all of our acts have this, what he calls an element of calculation. So, uh, you know, it's an interesting story about doing field work, about uh, the kinds of social and cultural systems and ideas that might accompany a non-market society and a non-hierarchical society. So we use that story to go into uh, the way that anthropologists tend to look at economy. And in some ways, or I guess I would say in many ways, uh, the way that anthropologists look at economics and the economy and what people do for a living is, uh, is larger or broader in the sense that when you go into most, uh, most economics classes, they are talking about market economies and places in which uh, you can quantify in terms of money, uh, the exchanges that are, that are going on. And so one of the main points that anthropology is looking at is that we're looking at the economy very broadly as a system of producing stuff, the production of distributing things, moving it around and then consuming things. And so, we, you know, these are not always distinct phases, but we like to kind of uh, categorize uh, when we're looking at different economies, try to do it uh, in this way. And so one of the main points is that, you know, there are non-market possibilities for how people make a living and do things, uh, and that these systems can work and be, uh, and work, especially I would say in a small or a, or a, a regional economy. We talked about uh, how people uh, move things around by reciprocity. And so it's not necessarily a monetary calculation. Uh, there might be calculation involved, but it's going to be uh, based on the, the goods and services that are exchanged in that. And there are different forms of reciprocity. Uh, we talked about both uh, generalized reciprocity and balanced reciprocity. Another form of, uh, of distribution, which uh, Lavin and Schultz mentioned here, and uh, we'll also be talking about this uh, when we come to our, our film for the next class, is the idea of redistribution. And in a, a society that is based upon redistribution, resources generally flow up. They often are a bit more hierarchical than the hunters and gatherers that we've been talking about. Resources flow up to one center or one person sometimes, and then are distributed out again uh, in the form of, uh, in, in various forms. And uh, we are, analogy for us is the taxation system. So people uh, contribute resources or are taxed uh, for resources, and then those are supposed to be put into other things like building roads and schools and bridges as a way of spending money collectively. So there are different ways that people, uh, that people can organize themselves and organize their economic life without necessarily having a market economy. And so also uh, related to this idea uh, is, what, uh, is what Marshall Sollins termed the original affluent society. And again, he, Sollins was here, uh, he was an anthropologist who was working with, uh, and, and the, uh, with Richard Lee's data and, and his field work. Uh, but what he, Sollins was proposing was that in societies that uh, like uh, that were hunters and gatherers, that they didn't have a large number of needs. And so the reason he called them original affluent society is he said that, you know, it's kind of like a numerator and a denominator. And since they didn't have a large number of needs, those needs were easily fulfilled. So this goes back to the idea that in in, uh, in hunting and gathering societies, you can all often fulfill all of your needs with 15 to 20 hours of work per week, which means you have plenty of what we might call leisure time for singing and dancing and storytelling. And so this is a, a, a we've looked at this before as a challenge to that 
progressivist line that agriculture and uh, makes everything better. And in Lee's work, what he was looking at was the uh, the mongongo nuts, or that was one of the things that that they had a lot of. And this comes up in Jared Diamond as well. It's an oft cited line. Why do I need to plant when there are so many mongongo nuts in the world? And mongongo nuts are these wonderful wild growing things that are a huge source of protein. And you know, if you have a lot of them, uh, you can combine them with other things and have a very nutritious uh, diet. And so the idea is why, why do you need to plant and labor and do all the things that people do in agricultural societies when in some ways uh, you can uh, enjoy the abundance of, and of, of nature itself. So this is one of the, again, a radical rethinking or a radical difference in how anthropologists would approach our thinking about the economy and what, uh, what an economic system was and the kind of, uh, the idea that, that people were, were progressing as they, as they moved along up, up through agriculture, uh, herding and agriculture and into our own, uh, our own uh, market economy. This is a very important uh, point, I think, that, that Lee and others made at the time. I want to shift gears a, a bit here, though, and ask a slightly, a slightly different question, which is about the tobacco and how people got tobacco and how people came to grow corn in lots of Africa and grow potatoes in, uh, in all across uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, and how in the Americas, uh, people came to have uh, horses and cows and sheep uh, and, um, and other uh, things that were uh, imported from what we call the old world. And so we've talked about this a little bit before, is that there was a whole series of things that happened way before, or long before any anthropologists hit the scene. And so by the time Lee arrives with the hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari, their world has already been massively transformed. They know about tobacco, they grow tobacco. They probably know people that grow corn. And so all of the societies that were studied by anthropologists uh, starting uh, you know, in the last hundred years had already been massively influenced by these global exchanges of crops, money, mining, people, people being moved to different places uh, out of Africa into the Americas. Uh, so a lot of things had changed by the time anthropologists showed up. And this leads us to think about um, the idea that uh, in Levin and Schultz, they talk about Eric Wolf's work they mostly talk about Eric Wolf's work in terms of what they call modes of production, or what Wolf calls modes of production, uh, drawing on the work of Karl Marx. And I wanna talk more about this book here because it was, it was so important for anthropology and actually it was extremely important for, for me. Um, I was uh, a, a new first year student in college. I took a history class and my professor assigned this book. She didn't make us read it all. She only had us read two chapters of it, which probably would have made me mad in a different time. But then I took it home over the summer, started reading the other chapters in it. And Eric Wolf uh, was an anthropologist who was also trying to do some history here. And he made several points in this book. And his main point is that the world that we see is not one of isolated societies. It is one in which people are connected and trading with each other. And so what he was describing was a world in which people were always interconnected and always uh, moving, trading, thinking, talking to each other. That was, I guess, I would say his main, his main point. 
Now he did go into this idea of different ways in which people organize their societies. He was in some ways simplifying uh, something that Karl Marx had been, uh, had been thinking about and elaborating it uh, from, what, uh, from what Marx had, had talked about and mostly because Marx mainly concentrated on capitalism. So Eric Wolf talked about three different modes of production. One was a, what he called a kin ordered mode of production, which is basically that people produce because they are related to each other uh, in families and in kinship. And that many societies uh, like hunters and gatherers, people who do small scale crops and herding societies are ordered by their relationship uh, as family members. And you produce and you consume and you distribute based on, you know, basically uh, the kinds of kinship ties that you have with other people in that group. He then talked about uh, a second mode of production, which he called tributary. And I think that in some ways, uh, the idea of reciprocity probably corresponds most to the kin ordered societies. And the idea of uh, redistribution or tribute uh, is, is corresponds to these societies that he called tributary. And so in these societies, there is more hierarchy. They are, there's more agriculture, farmers, uh, some herding societies where you have uh, more organization in terms of, 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 of having a, a clear hierarchy in which some people are ruling over others and either taxing them or getting some sort of tribute from them, they might then get some benefits in return and redistribution, but there is a, a clear uh, social order. It is not an egalitarian society. And then of course, the, he explained about the society that we all live in, the capitalist system in which people don't produce necessarily because somebody need something, you produce in order to make money from whatever you're making. Even something like farming uh, today, you don't farm because you need to eat cabbages, you farm because you want to sell cabbages. And if you sell cabbages, then you can buy other things. And so under the capitalist system, there's been an intensification of agriculture, an intensification of the relationships of production, such that uh, we have all the things that we see around us in some ways are a, are a product of this intensification of production. Eric Wolf's other point here though, he titles his book, Europe and the People Without History. I think I mentioned before that this was, he was, meaning to be ironic, he was saying that the people without, the people that the Europeans thought were people without history were actually those who made capitalism possible. That the labor relationships uh, that were established during colonialism were actually uh, without, without those relationships, uh, the whole capitalist system would not have come to be what it is. And so what Wolf was describing was a world that had emerged from interconnection more than a world that has, had emerged in isolation. And he was trying to figure out how these societies related to each other. And so when we turn back to the question of the Mongongo nuts, there's a different explanation for why there were so many Mongongo nuts in the world. And Part of this, I'm drawing on the work of anthropologist uh, Robert Gordon, who actually gave a, a lecture in this room about 12 years ago, I'm estimating. And it was about uh, a German, uh, a, a German led, basically a, a German led genocide in this area, uh, basically uh, of the people that Lee was studying, except about 60 years. 50 to 60 years before Lee got there. And Gordon said, you know, that he had talked to, well, it was actually difficult to get documentary evidence of this because you had to read 
the documents in German and you had to know the history of that area. And Gordon said that he had talked to Lee about this genocide and that Lee was like, ah, oh, but he didn't really take it into account. But if you think about it, if people were getting killed, if they were being colonized and killed, then 30 or 40 years later, there were probably going to be a lot fewer people in that area. And so the ratio of Mongongo nuts to people would be high. And so there's a, there's a slightly different explanation for why this, uh, why people were in the relationship with which they were. And this is why Gordon calls it the Bushman myth, because he, in, he sees that it wasn't necessarily that they were in a hunting and gathering relationship, but they were in a subordinate or underclass relationship in the Namibian economy, which had been a, an economy heavily influenced by colonialism. Now, I don't want to say that invalidates uh, Richard Lee's work because in some ways uh, the people there were in very different situations and, uh, and, and were able to preserve a lot of what they were, uh, of, of what they had been doing uh, before, the, before the colonial period. So this leads to uh, you know, my kind of general points about how anthropologists study and how we approach the idea of the economy. On the one hand, we need to, uh, like Lee does here and like we see in the textbook, describe systems that, were, uh, that are not capitalist, are not necessarily based on money. And so it's been very important to help people to understand that not everything has to be a market economy in order to have a successful, sustainable system. We have also been at the forefront, I believe, of describing those people who had been subordinated uh, to uh, the capitalist system as it became produced. And so this is something that, that many people sort of denied when we think about sort of the enslavement of Africans in the Americas, people didn't associate that with the rise of industrial capitalism or would say, oh no, that's, that's, that's sort of a holdover. That's sort of some sort of primitive thing that doesn't, that, that we got rid of when people started working for wages. And so uh, one of the things that anthropologists did was to describe how this system emerged. And so, what I see it is, is trying to strike this balance, what I call anthropology's impossible task between, you know, trying to explain how different people can organize their lives in a rich and viable and sustainable way outside of Western relationships, but without losing sight of how they have been influenced, how much colonial relationships, how much capitalism has in fact changed their interrupted, uh, changed people's way of life and put everyone into this position where they're feeding resources into a global system. And so then there's the other side of this that, you know, even though people are participating in a global system in which they might be seen as the underdog or the, the, uh, the people who are at the bottom of the system, they also respond in creative ways to the situation in which they're in. And humans are, are tremendously resilient and, uh, and creative, even in the most adverse circumstances. And so that's bring this to, I, I would say, the final two parts of the Lavin and Schultz chapter. Uh, I was glad to see that many of you were interested in this uh, story about Coca-Cola in Trinidad. And what Daniel Miller is saying there is that we often see Coca-Cola as this Americanized global company, big company gonna smash people and, and, and make, the, make life miserable and, and replace any local beverages. And it turns out that at least in Trinidad, there's a lot of, of local influence over the Coca-Cola bottling and it's incorporated into their society in a whole different way than 
uh, than we would we would imagine, and is not seen as Americanization, or is not seen as as this kind of uh, evil consumerism at all. And so, you know, it's a really kind of important account that you know, in even in a in a global system uh, in which everyone is in some ways participating in capitalism, that there are differences, the regional differences, the local differences continue to be important. And I also think that's true at the very end of the chapter when she's talking about the Italian food ways, which are certainly have been transformed over the years, but it's not, it, they haven't all been homogenized. They're not all doing exactly the same thing as we might have expected under what we might call globalization or, or uh, you know, capitalist transformation. So again, oftentimes we look uh, anthropologically at the, the small society. We lament that in some ways people's life ways uh, were, were, uh, were changed or interrupted. But we also need to understand that a lot of things uh, have been preserved or have been, uh, people are able to make creative choices uh, within the constraints in which they operate. So hopefully I think that, you know, going from the, the classic article uh, by Richard Lee into some of this economic material will help us to understand some of these themes, which can get pretty complicated pretty quickly.